Dr. James Strickler. And this lesson is for Chapter 8, The Market Revolution, in the United States History Textbook, American Yop. The first thing to know to understand the material in this chapter is about the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was a giant social change that began in England and eventually spread across the Atlantic to the United States. It was a time in which uh, people came up with new inventions that allowed processes that had previously been done by hand to instead then be done by machines. This made society much more productive, but it also changed the way people functioned in society. This was all made power and possible, excuse me, initially by the invention of the steam engine, which could then power these various machines used in factories and in transportation. The transportation revolution was a subset of the industrial revolution. Machines that were created that allowed goods and people to be transported over long distances much more cheaply. Among these inventions were the steamboat and the locomotive. Eventually, these transportation ideas spread to the United States of America. And in a short time, they dramatically changed the amount of time that it would take to travel various places. Look at these two maps and compare them. Prior to the transportation revolution, made possible by the steam engine and the industrial revolution, it would take you about five weeks to get from New York to New Orleans. Afterwards, it would only take about two weeks. It would only take you about one week to get to Savannah, Georgia, while before it would have taken you two weeks. Essentially, it was cutting travel times in half, even with the early, more primitive forms of mechanized uh, transportation. In addition to new machines being created, new places for those machines to operate were created also, such as the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal was a canal dug across New York State, which connected the Great Lakes with the Hudson River Valley, which allowed goods to be produced in the Midwest and then moved to the Great Lakes and then across the Erie Canal and then down the Hudson River to New York City, where these things could be put on ships and shipped anywhere in the world. This actually cut the cost of, of transporting these goods from the Midwest to the Atlantic seaboard by 95%. This wasn't the only canal that was dug to make more efficient transportation possible. There were several canals dug during this time period. By 1840, they were spread all across the North North east and the midwest of the United States, making travel times shorter, making the distribution of goods and, and people more efficient. One of the things that made these canals so much more efficient um, was the invention of the steamboat in England, which eventually spread to the United States, which then allowed Robert Fulton to develop the first commercially viable steamboat line, moving people and goods up and down the Hudson River. Once he had found a way to construct a boat that could be financially profitable, then this practice spread all through the country. The locomotive also was used to allow transportation of goods and people to become more efficient. It was so efficient that cities like Baltimore tried to improve their economies by starting their own railroad companies to connect them with the products that were being created in the Midwest. Baltimore created the, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company that would pay for the building of lines that would bring goods to Baltimore to enhance the value of it as a port city. In addition to these technologies that were created to move goods and people, there were also technologies created that simply made work easier for everyone. This was particularly possible in the United States because of an idea called patents 
which was actually written into the Constitution. This is a process by which the government essentially gives somebody a license to exclusively market a product that they have invented for a certain amount of time. This encourages invention because an inventor then knows that rather than their product being stolen by other people who see it and say, oh my gosh, yeah, what a great idea, I'll make my own now. Instead, those people will have to pay them for it. This encourages people to create inventions because they know they can make a profit from it. And once you encourage the creation of inventions in this way, you get more inventions. Examples of those that were created by Americans during this time period are the telegraph created by Samuel Morris that allowed communication over long distances, over wires with electricity. No longer would it take days or weeks for letters to be carried by horseback. Instead, messages could be sent almost instantly across long distances. Another invention by an American was the mechanical reaper, which allowed for the harvesting of grain in a more efficient fashion, created by a man named Cyrus McCormick. And a third example of an invention by an American that saved labor, allowed people to be more productive, was the steel bladed plow, 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 excuse me, the steel bladed plow invented by John Deere in 1807. Now remember, I'm not going to ask you about dates on the exams. These are dates are just there for you to, to see how these things fit together. The plow made farming much more efficient, the planting of food, I should say, in farming. The mechanical reaper allowed its harvesting to be more efficient. These sorts of inventions by Americans made Mer America more efficient, and eventually they spread around the world too, as, P as these inventors sold these inventions not just to Americans, but people in other countries. In addition to the transportation revolution and these labor-saving technologies that were created, there was also a market revolution during this time period. In other words, new ways of doing business. One of the most significant changes was that the United States moved away from people using metal currency or barter goods to using commonly paper money we moved to a cash economy. Now, originally, it was not the United States government that was printing the money. Instead, it was private banks that would, would print the money. These were called banknotes. So you could deposit money at a bank and then get a piece of paper representing that money. And you could then trade that piece of paper to someone for a good or a service. And then they could take that paper to the bank and get the money that you had deposited. So once banks did this, eventually the United States government would do it. An intermediate step along the way was when the Bank of the United States, uh, an entity operating like any other bank but owned by the United States, also issued banknotes. This was the beginning of official currency of the United States government. In addition to paper money being uh, more readily available, which made business more efficient. It's a whole lot easier to pay for things with just a slip of paper rather than a bag of gold. Another thing that happened was the recognition of corporations as legal entities with legal rights. This happened in a United States Supreme Court case in 1819, when the state of New Hampshire tried to take over the private university of Dartmouth. Well, the people in charge of Dartmouth fought back. Their case eventually went to the United States Supreme Court and they won. And the decision that allowed them to win recognized that corporations can exist with real rights that can't just be overridden by the government. Like, for example, the rights of individual people can't be overridden by the government either. This gave people the confidence to then invest in corporations because they knew that they wouldn't just disappear, that they were legally recognized entities. Corporations provide a way for people to collect their assets, to do business together with everyone sure of what's going on. They can become bigger than, than any individual, allowing economies of scale where they can, by producing more things, do them more cheaply. Along with paper money, this was a significant development in the economy of the United States. Some people quickly learned how to take advantage of these developments. 
such as this man, Stephen Girard. He was an immigrant from France who eventually transitioned from being in shipping to being in banking. And he became fabulously wealthy doing it as he made funds available to other people for them to use for their businesses. And he took a percentage of the profit as a result. He actually became the richest man in America during this time period and one of the richest men in the world. But these developments in the market economy weren't necessarily always good. Once you had paper money circulating, it became much easier for people to be cheated. They, there could be counterfeit bills created, fake money. And there were confidence men that would convince people to invest, say, in a corporation or something like that, while it was all a fantasy, a lie. Confidence men are now called for short in our modern, modern language, con men, who rip people off. Well, these kind of things flourished during this time period also because these new developments were confusing for people. They could be taken advantage of, and the tools were more readily available for this also. So there was both good to this market revolution and also bad for some people. These sorts of changes in the economy also made possible wild ups and downs in the economy, leading to uh, regular depressions, now, what I mean by a depression is a time period in which the economy overall suffers, where people aren't making as many things, they aren't producing as many profits, the economy of the country is actually contracting rather than growing. And one of the causes of these depressions that repeatedly happen were, was that a panic of one sort or another would sweep the population, a panic over speculative investments. See, what would happen is there'd be some new opportunity out there and people would invest money in it. And the price of this new opportunity would go up, which would then cause people to say, wow, profits can be made there. My neighbor invested this money and now the value of the things go, gone up. Now they're richer. I'll go invest too. But those kind of uh, investments that drive the price of something to go up can only go on for so long before the price has outstripped the actual value of the thing. This is called speculation. When you invest money, not because you think the thing is actually worth what, you, the, what you're paying for it, but because you assume that someone else later on will be willing to pay more for it. Well, that'll happen for a while, but eventually the bubble that's created by it bursts. This happened in 1819 as people speculated about the price of Western lands that were being settled. It happened again in 1837 as people again were caught up in land speculation and also speculation about products like cotton. It happened again in 1857 when people speculated about the value of railroad companies and invested in them more than they should have. So this happened regularly during this time period. It was a freewheeling period in American history where vast profits could be made, but also there were vast dangers. Another thing that changed during this time period was the movement into what we call the factory system. Previous to this, the way manufactured products were, were produced was through the piecework system. Now, what happened in the piecework system was the various steps of producing something, like for example, a shirt, were divided up. And then they were um, pieced out to various workers who would work the, the steps by hand, sometimes even at home rather than in a place of business or a factory. So you might send a shirt to a group of women, or I should say a big bunch of shirts to a group of women who would take them home and also the buttons on them. While previously, somebody else sewed the collars on them. While previously, somebody else cut the material or whatever it may be. So there'd be a step-by-step -step way of doing this where people would just repetitively do the same step over and over again. Sew on buttons, sew on buttons, sew on buttons, sew on buttons, and get paid for all the buttons they sewed on. But it was still generally being done by hand, by individual people, and like I said, oftentimes in their homes. Well, one of the things that made it possible for this to be replaced by the factory system, which grew out of the Industrial Revolution, was something called the New England Fall Line. Okay, what this is, is it's a geographic feature. All across the eastern United States, there is a fall zone. 
where the elevation of the terrain dramatically drops. You have highlands toward the interior of the country dropping to lowlands that go out to the coast. Well, in the southern United States, this fall zone is well inland, while in New England, it was almost right on the coast. Now, the reason this is important is because you can create factories on this fall zone where the waterfalls are. You can use them for power. And if they're right by the coast, then it's no problem getting your materials to the coast to then be shipped around and be sold. So this is the ideal place to set up factories. And that's exactly what happened. In New England, water powered mills were created along the fall line where they created all kinds of manufactured products. They would use the waterfall to create power to run machines to help produce these products more efficiently, which then they could ship away very easily from the coast and sell all around the country or all around the world. These factories were made possible because of industrial espionage. What espionage is, is spying. What happened was people would rob the businesses in England that had created these inventions as part of the industrial revolution, rob them of their secrets. They would figure out how to make the same machines that were being made in England and then come and install them in the factories in America. Among the people that did this was a man named Samuel Slater. Samuel Slater was an immigrant to America. He had worked in the factories in England. He had saw how the machines worked. And so when he came to America, he built similar machines and even improved upon them. A couple of these are the yarn spinning machine and the carding machine, which are both used in the production of cloth for clothing. Samuel Slater developed these for the American industrial system and became an important figure in the industrialization of America. Another man who also got his secrets from England was a man named Francis Cabot Lowell. Francis Cabot Lowell spent a couple of years touring around England, looking at their factories and memorizing how their system worked, how their machines operated. When he left England, he was searched thoroughly to see if he had made any written down plans that they could confiscate. No, he kept it all in his head. And then when he got back into America, he set up factories based on this. But the factories were not just based upon the English machines, but on the English way of doing things, where they would centralize the labor in a, in a central location, a factory, rather than doing the piecework system. And they would give people very specific tasks to do that didn't require a lot of skill. So they could bring in unskilled, uneducated laborers, take a short time to train them, and man the entire factory with them. So they wouldn't have to pay the kind of wages that you would have to pay if you were hiring people with a bunch of skill and experience. This made the factories cheaper to run. This made this system more efficient. It brought down the costs of the goods that they were producing, which allowed more people to buy them. This was called the Waltham Lowell system, and it spread not just from his factories, but to factories throughout America. With people now working in, this, in these factories, this led to a change in the relationship between laborers and their bosses. This new kind of, doing wor new kind of way of doing work was called free labor. And what was meant by that was that the workers were freed of the master-apprentice relationship that had previously existed. So let's go back to the piecework system. So let's say you're a seamstress in that piecework system. You're the person at home sewing, say, the sleeves on, on shirts. Well, the way you learn how to do that is you, as a young person, get a job with some other seamstress who shows you how to do it. And at least initially, when you're an apprentice, you are not paid very well at all. And you're kind of obligated to work there for the person who trained you, at least for a certain amount of time, to pay them back for having um, shared these skills with you. And so in some ways, it locked people in for long periods of time, working with the same person and never feeling like they were free to leave. 
Well, the factories created a much more impersonal system, as already described, where each worker is given a very small task that can be easily mastered. They don't have to go through the complicated detail master-apprentice relationship to master a whole trade. Instead, they can come in unskilled and be trained in a few days and have their job. This allowed a certain freedom for the workers. If they didn't like working one place, they could just pack up and go to a different factory and try to get a job there. Now that sounds good in some ways, rather than being anchored to a master and an apprentice relationship. But there's also a bad side to it, and that was the freedom of the factory owner. Because all the workers are so relatively unskilled, he can replace them at any time. So if they demand too much, he just simply fires that person and hires somebody else. So this potentially drives down their wages. So while they are free to look for better jobs, there may not necessarily be better jobs out there. This new system of factory labor also caused a change in the way families worked. Back in a time period before the factories, many people um, had small family businesses or they worked on farms. And the wife and children participated in things. So let's imagine there's a farm and they're out plowing the fields or picking apples or whatever it would be. You might have your five-year-old child out there helping pick apples also. Well, when labor moved into the factory, this also meant that women and children might move into the factory. Now think about what I described about free labor. As people are competing for these jobs, the wages earned from them are driven down. So a family may not be able to just have the father go out and work and earn enough money to take care of the family. Instead, the mother may need to work also, and even the children may need to work. In fact, in some cases, the children working was very valuable to the factory, as they might be able to do things that adults couldn't do, such as climb in among the intricate machinery to um, uh, repair something, or to feed lines through, or whatever it may be, so that the machine could run and, cr and create its product. So women and children were a big important part of the labor force during this time of industrialization. Now the workers recognized all the potential pitfalls in this. And so to try to have more power over their situation, they would organize together collectively in what became known as labor unions. The idea of a labor union was, if I as an individual go into the boss and say, you aren't paying me enough, give me more, he can easily fire me and replace this single person. If on the other hand, all 300 people in the factory effectively go into the boss and say, you give us all a raise or we all quit, that's a different question. Because if the boss fires everyone, not only is the factory going to be shut down while he rehires a whole new labor force, but also while he trains them. It may take weeks, months, a long time to replace them. And in that time, he's not doing any business, not selling any product. And not only that, his competitors are gobbling up his market share. The people that he would be selling with to are now creating relationships with his competitors instead. And so when he finally gets everyone rehired, he may not have any contracts left to sell any anything. So it might be a better deal for him to just give all 300 people a raise. So this is how labor unions are thinking they're going to improve the lot of their members, the workers. But sometimes to accomplish this, they would have to go on strikes. In other words, refuse to work. They effectively shut down the factory and try to force the factory owner to give in to their demands. One of the demands they frequently had were for the creation of what are called closed shops where the agreement would be that nobody would be hired in that shop in the future unless they were members of the union and they were hired under the terms of the union. Without that notion of a closed shop, the employer could potentially hire somebody else who's not a union member for less. Give them a different deal, if not necessarily a better deal. Well, that threatens the power of the union. So they want closed shops that prevent anybody from getting hired there unless they join the union first. Now, for the individual worker, that may or may not be a good deal. Maybe they'll get paid better because they're a union worker, but the union's going to charge them dues, make them pay the union for the privilege of working there. And what if you're a particularly good worker? 
in a factory where no one's a member of the union, maybe you would get paid more because you are more productive. But in a union factory, maybe you have to get paid the same as everybody else. There are always costs and benefits to these things. But generally speaking, the workers in these factories oftentimes viewed the idea of joining a union as a way to have more power over their situation. One of the things that workers try to demand um, through such things as joining unions and going on strikes was a 10 hour work day. Now, oftentimes workers had to work 12, 15 or 16 hours in a day. And so the idea of a 10 hour work day was sort of a crazy dream. And it did not happen right away. But this push for what eventually would become a 12 hour day and then a 10 hour day, and then eventually what we have today is a commonly accepted eight hour day was something that successfully happened over a long time period, but not immediately. And what happened was the workers put pressure on the owners of these factories, the owners of these businesses, by saying, if you don't reduce our hours, we're just all going to quit. And again, the owners in the situation of what's going to be a better deal for me to give in and keep them working or to fire them and replace them with somebody else who actually will work the 12 or 15 hours. While they did not succeed immediately in this general push from the labor unions to get a 10 hour day, there were smaller successes. Like for example, in 1842, Massachusetts passed its child labor law, which said that children working in factories who were under the age of 10 could not be forced to work more than 10 hours a day. Now this may seem crazy to us today. The idea of an eight year old or a seven year old working 12 or 15 hour days, that just seems kind of insane to us. How could that even happen? Well, unless maybe you've grown up on a farm and you can see how it could happen. But, that, but in our modern factory system, that is unheard of. But once upon a time, this was a common practice. As again, these children could do things because of their small bodies that adult workers couldn't do. They were valuable in these factories and they were important workers to help provide for the family because mom, and, mom or dad by themselves couldn't necessarily earn enough money in the factories to provide for the family. So the children oftentimes had to work too. But this was the beginning of a movement away from that, which would eventually lead to the end of child labor. But to begin with, it was just a matter of reducing the hours that children worked. Another important thing that happened because of this factory system was the immigration of laborers from elsewhere in the world. As the Industrial Revolution took hold in America, it became known as the land of opportunity, that people could immigrate from other countries and come here and find jobs and build a life for themselves that they otherwise would not have. During this time period of the early 1800s, two of the countries that most prominently sent settlers, new immigrants to the United States of America, were Germany and Ireland. Germans oftentimes immigrated, came through the port cities, and then moved west to become farmers in places like Wisconsin and Minnesota, later other places around the country too. Irish workers tended to stop in the cities when they reached them. They would come in in ships from Ireland to try to find a better life where they could make more wages and not uh, be hungry and poor. And they would stop in the cities where they landed, whether they be New York or Boston or Philadelphia, and they would find jobs there in factories in the city. They became important workers. But for the people who already lived there in these places, these new immigrants were seen as competition. Because, for example, the Irish coming from a destitute place in Ireland where they were possibly close to starving to death and then getting to America, they'd be willing to take just about any wage to work. It was better than what they had at home. Well, the American who was had been living here as part of uh, groups that had immigrated maybe 100, 200 years before, um, they were thought of themselves as Americans, not as Englishmen or wherever they came from. They had gotten used to a more luxurious lifestyle. They'd gotten used to being paid higher wages. Now here come along the Irish immigrants willing to take lower wages. Well, if you're the factory owner, you may well say, well, gosh, why should I keep paying these Americans more when I can hire Irishmen that'll work for less? And so 
as these immigrants came from Germany and Ireland, there arose a, a prejudice against them. This led to what became known as the nativist movement. Nativist meaning natives, people who are born in America, should have the best of America, rather than immigrants coming from the outside and driving down wages and making America in some ways a worse place. We see reflections of this here in our own time period, as people have similar worries about immigrants coming in from Mexico or Central America. They come here and they take jobs for lower wages that otherwise Americans could have for higher wages. But again, there's a trade-off. By the immigrants coming in and taking the jobs for lower wages, the the system becomes more efficient, the products can be sold more cheaply, which means the businesses sell more of them, not just Americans, but other places around the world, and this helps the overall economy. But it doesn't seem very helpful if you're one of those people who is a native-born American who loses their job to a recent immigrant, because that recent immigrant is willing to work under worse conditions to you for, for lower wages than you. So people who became disgruntled about this formed this movement, the nativist movement, to try to oppose immigration from these places where the workers would come and undercut them. A political party formed around this nativist movement, which we'll actually discuss again later in the course. They became known as the Know Nothing Party, and they were explicitly anti-immigrant. Here, they ha there's a cartoon depicting some of their worries. You see a man in a beer barrel um, who is supposed to be a German. You see a man in a whiskey barrel who's supposed to be an Irishman. And you see them running away with a ballot box. This is one of the worry that, worries that Native Americans had. When I say Native Americans, I have to be careful. I don't mean American Indians. I mean people of European ancestry who had been living in America for generations who were native born. They saw these immigrants coming in and settling in large numbers in particular areas, such large numbers that they could effectively take over the democratic process in that area. There'd be so many Irishmen or so many Germans that they would just simply outvote the native born people. And this was seen as them coming to our country and stealing the process, the political process from Americans. So this concern led to the creation of an explicitly anti-immigrant party, which became known as the Know Nothing Party. Now, this wasn't its actual name. It was given this nickname because it was kind of secretive. Uh, people didn't really want others to know that they were a part of this party because they could get, be accused of being bigots or whatever it may be. So when they would go to these party meetings and they would leave them and somebody would ask them, hey, have you been at a meeting for this party? They'd say, no, I know nothing. I know nothing about it. And that became their standard reply to claim ignorance, even as they were supporting the movement. Family relations also changed as a result of the Industrial Revolution. We've talked before about the principle of coverture. This was the idea that women, when they married a man, um, ceased to be legally independent. Anything and everything they do passed through the man. They couldn't sign a contract for anything. The man would do it on their behalf, for example. So women lived in a, um, a place in society where their husband stood between them and the world. This was reflected in an ideal that was held in America at the time of separate spheres, that the man would go out and deal with the dirty, nasty world, and the woman would stay in the private home. There she was supposed to be a Republican mother, raising up the children and the virtues of the country. She was supposed to be nurturing their educational and emotional development as the man dealt with the bad things of the world and kept them away from his idyllic family. Now, this wasn't always the case, obviously, particularly if you were a poor family where the mother might have to go to work or even the children would have to go to work just so the family would need enough to survive. But if you were upper middle class or upper class, this was the ideal, and everyone in the country seemed to aspire to it. Even those poor families where children and mothers were forced to work wished that they didn't have to be in that situation. 
This then led to the ideal of a romantic childhood. And by romantic here, we don't mean like people falling in love, like uh, uh, husband and wife kind of thing. No, we re mean romantic in the sense of it being an idealized vision. The ideal of a perfect little home where the children are sheltered from the evils of the world, where they are taught to read and write, where they are taught to do their duty to God and to their country, where they're taught to love their fellow man, that kind of thing, where they are protected from the bad things of the world by their parents and can grow up to be ideal citizens. The Industrial Revolution also took place at a time when slave relationships were changing. As the factory system took hold in America, there was less and less need for slaves in certain industries and in certain places. Slaves became particularly obsolete in the northeastern part of the United States, where agriculture was not good for the um, mass worker system used in the plantation of the South. The terrain did not support the same sort of large farms producing the same kinds of labor intensive crops. So you didn't need slaves to work your farm. Instead, your family and maybe a few hired hands could do it. Also, as the factory system came in, you didn't really need slaves to work the factories. As people competed for those jobs, the wages were low enough that you could turn a profit without needing slaves. Oftentimes, just paying the workers might be cheaper than what it would be to feed and house and close slaves to do the same jobs. This oftentimes led when eventually disputes broke out between the North and the South over slavery. It led to Southerners accusing the factory system in the North of employing what they called wage slaves, white people that were in a system where they were really no better off than slaves. But setting that aside for the moment, the truth was that slaves that were in what we previously called chattel slavery, where they were held as slaves because of their race, was not something that was needed any longer in the Northeast. And so states in the Northeast passed laws to end slavery. And the legal ending of slavery is called emancipation. Emancipation is the ending of slavery done by the government. But there's another way that slavery can end, rather than for vast groups of people, instead for individual slaves. And this is called manumission. This is when a slave master grants his slave his freedom. Now, the, this was easier to do in places where slavery was coming to an end anyway. In southern states where they were worried about having too large a free population, which might inspire the, the slave population to rebellion and seeking their freedom, as we've talked about before in this course, you might make it very difficult for manumission to take place. Like, for example, George Washington had a bunch of slaves, but he came to believe that slavery was an in, morally incorrect practice. So he wanted to free all his slaves. But there was a law in Virginia at the time where he lived that required a slave master before freeing his slaves to ensure that the slaves would not become a burden upon the state. In other words, he had to set aside enough money to take care of these slaves, whether they ever got a job again or not. That takes a lot of money. George Washington, by the end of his life, was able to put together enough money that one of his dying wishes that was fulfilled was the manumission of his slaves. But that was an uncommon practice in those places. Oftentimes, even when slaves were emancipated, it was a gradual process. Here's an example from 1784 in the state of Connecticut. Connecticut passed a law officially ending slavery in the state. But the way the law was created, anybody under the age of 25 was still a slave. And anyone born to them while they were a slave would also be a slave. So think about this. This is going to carry on for a long time then. Any young slaves that have children are themselves going to be slaves until they're 25 years old. And then any children they have will also be slaves. And so the practice of slavery, while it would continue to diminish in Connecticut, could go on potentially for generations. And in fact, by 50 years after this law being passed, even though Connecticut didn't start out with a lot of slaves to begin with, 
there were still over 3,000 slaves in Connecticut, even though it was officially by that point a free state. Another thing that affected the relationship between the white majority and the slave masters and slaves was the idea of capturing fugitive slaves. So as some places ended the practice of slavery, individual slaves might think the way to no longer be a slave was to escape to those places. But there's actually a passage in the Constitution called the Fugitive Slave Clause that says any person who is held in service or labor, in other words, a slave, in one state cannot escape to another. If they are found there, then they must be discharged. In other words, delivered up to be brought back into their slavery. So you simply couldn't, you were not able to, as a slave, to simply flee, say Georgia, where you might be a slave, and move to New York, let's say, where slavery was illegal, and say, ah, I'm not a slave anymore. Nope. If you were captured, you could be forced back into slavery. Matter of fact, the state had an obligation under the Constitution to restore you to slavery. To try to enforce this notion, the United States Congress passed a Fugitive Slave Act that made clear who it was that could pursue the slaves, recapture the slaves, and what the obligations were of the free states to assist in this, and what the penalties would be if they did not assist. This meant that even northern states that were free were places that slaves could be captured. And legally speaking, the states were expected to cooperate with that. But the nature of where slaves were, were needed was not just changing in the north because of the Industrial Revolution. It was changing in the south also because of the change in profitability of certain crops. Tobacco which had been the original cash crop of the United States, was not declining in profitability. Tobacco was being spread, grown other places in the world. And as the price dropped, the value of having slaves to harvest it became more questionable. Was it really worth having all these people that you had to feed and clothe and house? Or wasn't it? So as some of these crops, such as tobacco, were declining in profitability, and that's declining in the necessity to have slaves, something else happened, which meant that rather than slavery declining in the United States, it actually expanded. That something was the invention in 1793 of the cotton gin by a man named Eli Whitney. Eli Whitney found a way through a mechanical device to remove cotton seeds from cotton. Now, this is the most laborious part, part of the cotton production process. This is why having um, hands-on for cotton production was so important. You had to have people pick out every little seed. Once a machine could do it instead, then suddenly cotton became easier to grow and it became more profitable. Now, you could have vast fields of cotton that could earn the cotton growers money. But even though the seeds no longer had to be picked out by hand, other steps of the process needed to be. This then led to an expansion of slavery in the South and slavery eventually becoming the heart of a cotton economy that drove the economy of the entire nation. Slaves were employed, employed in the South to harvest the cotton. The cotton was then shipped to the North where you had these factories along the fall line and it was turned into cloth. So even though those northern states might say that they were officially not slave states, they still profited off of the slavery system, which provided them with the raw materials, the cotton, at a reasonable price. So both north and south economies were dependent upon slavery during this time period. And cotton became so productive became such a boon to the entire country as the South harvested it and then the North processed it into cloth and then sold it, that slavery expanded dramatically during this time period. Here's a couple maps that, that show the expansion of slavery from 1790 to 1860. You can see that it moved west and the areas where there was a high concentration of slaves shown in the dark colors became more spread out too. 
And what you can see in the map of 1860 is that the places where slaves were most concentrated were the places where the soil was most um, ready to supply large crops of cotton. That's where the slaves were brought in, that's where they settled, and that's where the black population of the South became most concentrated and is most concentrated to this day. So slavery and the cotton economy that was built upon it were important to America in this time period. And the continued practice of this would eventually lead to the American Civil War. That does it for the lecture for chapter eight, 